word that I would like to introduce our new interim pastor, Les Bartlett. He served at Elma last. And I knew I recognized him, and he did my brother's funeral about three or four years ago. Did Gerald Oh, yes. <laughs> but he will be with us until we get a permanent person, which will be in July. And his wife, Judy, who I can already determine is a joy. <laughs> <laughs> but we're just so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for coming to serve us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> There, I'm, 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 now I'm live. <laughs> it's been almost a year since I filled the pulpit, so bear with me. Uh, I'll be rusty, and I will make mistakes. I'm not perfect, even though most people think I am. <laughs> so forgive me if I, if I forget a name, because there's a lot of people to remember. And about the time I get all your names, then you're going to have somebody else in here. So... Uh, I, I really look forward to coming and doing this. I, I kind of missed being in the pulpit. After I retired, I wondered if that was the right thing to do. And it was because my wife and I could do some more things than, that we hadn't been able to do. But I'm glad to get back into this for even a short period of time. So I greet you this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad you're here. Now... I see that you have had in the last order of worship a children's sermon. And uh, what I would like to do, I, I don't think that uh, the majority of the young people that come to church any longer are, uh, that I know of in the small churches I've served are, are children. I think of children as babies to six to seven years old, and then after that, you're a young person. <laughs> so... What I'm going to say is we are going to have young people's sermons from here on out, if that's okay. Uh, if I change something that you have been used to and you don't like, be sure and tell me. It may not make any difference, but you can tell me. <laughs> so, do we have any young people this morning that would like to come forward? Oh, good. <laughs> We will, we will socially distance so that we're okay. And you're from the same family, I assume, so it shouldn't be a problem. Um, what I would like for you to do is uh, think about this. There are so many things that we want to do as a young person that uh, um, it's hard when we try to incorporate the, the, a, a sermon or something like that into a, uh, something that the adults are going to hear. So... Please don't think I'm talking down to you, but I try to just make it as simple as we can, okay? Because maybe somewhere in what I say, there'll be some, some words of wisdom that you can take back home with you. I've got something for you. this to the, to the, okay. Would you take that one? Would you take that one? Okay, and you might hang on to that too. Alright. So, the way you took that, it, it, I think maybe you've, uh, you've used one of these before, right? Are they good helpers around the house? Alright, alright. They help their mom clean the church. Aha. Uh -huh. See, I was going to say, you know what we use these for? But you already know. We, we use these to clean the church. We use these to clean the uh, home. We use them to clean our rooms. So you have a broom, and you have a mop, and here's a dust cloth, and there's some Windex. But you already clean afterwards. So I was going to say, okay, now that you have not you can stick around and, and clean, but you're going to do that anyway, right? Okay, good. Uh, I use these mops as props for the, the uh, purpose of being able to, to give you some information. Because a lot of people learn because it's visual. But I also consider these as symbols. I... 
I have the sermons a lot in, in my sermons. I talk about symbols, symbols of the church, symbols of things that's going on in the community. And we need to look at a mop and a broom as a symbol. It is a symbol of cleaning. You know about cleaning the, the sanctuary. It looks nice, by the way. You, you've done a good job. Uh, it, it, it's used at home. Your mom or whoever does the cleaning around the house, maybe dad does, I don't know. Uh, I do it at my house. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody cleans the house because it's nice and makes it nice and you can live in. Somebody cleans your room. <laughs> okay. We'll touch on that here in just a little bit. <laughs> but it, it's a symbol. It's a symbol of cleaning. And not only do we want to clean the, the church and the, and the house and, and the room, sometimes we have to clean something else. You know what that something else is? That something else is our minds and our soul. A lot of times we, we know right from wrong and, 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 and we do really well for a while and then we kind of ease up a little bit and, and then we start maybe thinking about some things we shouldn't think about or, or see something that probably we should not see. Or, so that, that, that clutters up your mind. That puts dust and dirt in your mind, let's say, okay? And so how do you clean that? Can you use a mop to do that? No. A broom, a dustpan, Windex, can you do that? No. The way you clean your mind is you go to church or, or, or Sunday school or, or Bible study. And what you do is with that is you take what you see and you read and you hear and that dusts off the things that shouldn't be in there. So I want you to remember Everybody's going to do something wrong sometimes. Everybody's going to think about doing something wrong sometimes. But when you're reminded through a sermon or a Bible verse or something your mom and dad tells you, that cleans your mind out. So that's kind of what I want to get at when we talk about cleaning. It takes more than just a broom and a mop to clean our minds. Okay? Okay. I have a project for you. You probably already do this, but this week I want you to pick some things up in your room. I want you to clean it a little bit so when mom or dad or whoever does the cleaning goes in that their job's a little bit easier. Can you do that? He nodded. Did you nod? <laughs> yeah, apparently. Okay. I, 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 will check. I will check with the folks when, when they're here next week, okay? It's... Let's be in an attitude of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the young people that come in. And, and we just ask that you be with them and guide them. We know that uh, things aren't going to be easy for them. It's, it's not easy in the world we live in. But from time to time, we just ask that you reach down and touch them, clean their minds, clean their hearts, put them back on the right road, and send them on down. And we thank you for these two young people that are here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming forward. At the last uh, church that I attended, when I said, would the young people please come forward, the invitation was to young people of any age. And you would be surprised how many adults came down, especially when they saw what kind of props we had, or some of them came down for the candy. But if we ever say, when the young people come forward and you want to, you want to do that, you are welcome to come forward at that time as well. I always like to have something from the hymnal. I understand we don't sing from them but um, as, a, as a congregation, but there are some things in there that I like to, to read. And, what I've chosen this morning is the Canticle of Love, found in your hymnal on uh, page uh, 646. Let love be genuine and live in harmony. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Outdo one another in showing honor, be humble and never conceited. Love is stronger than death, and jealousy is cruel as the grave. Floods cannot drown love and wealth cannot buy it. 
But love above all else. Let Christ's peace rule your hearts. Always be forgiving as Christ has forgiven you. Love is not jealous or boastful, arrogant, rude, or stubborn, irritable, resentful, or possessive. Love is patient and kind. Do not love in word or speech only. Love also in deed and truth. Receive each other in sincerity. Find mercy and grow old together. Love rejoices in the right. It bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things. For love is faithful and endless. Dad, I believe you're going to read the uh, scriptures for us. I will. I have to remember this. <clears throat> Pastor Les, we're so excited to have you here. Thank you. And I want to share just a quick comment. I think many of you know that, that I enjoy reading first in the, in the Old Testament and then going to the New Testament. And I was excited this morning when Pastor said, I'd like you to read from Numbers, which is the fourth book in the Bible, the fourth book of, that Moses wrote. It's in the first in the Old Testament. And then we went to John, the good news of John. It doesn't get any better than that, going from Numbers to John. <laughs> so I want, I want to share with you, uh, first reading from Numbers, it would be 21, chapter 21, uh, verses four through nine. And then we're gonna to go to the good news of John in uh, chapter three, 14 through 21. Now, Normally, as I do, Pastor reads from the NIV. I'm reading from the RSV, which is our church Bible. So the verbiage is slightly different, but it tells the story. Dan, you might pick up the microphone because that's hard here. Thank you. Does that work? That works great. Good. Okay. Well, thanks for pointing that out. I'm not quite full, but it helps. <laughs> if my fingers are worked out, we're going to continue with the program. Okay, here we go. We're reading from Numbers, chapter, uh, chapter 21, verses 4 through, uh, uh, through, no, 4 through 9, I'm sorry. From Mount Or, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest the miserable food. And then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent. Make a poisonous serpent and set it on the pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. And now we're going to go to John, and we'll be reading from John 3, 14 through 21. John 3, 14 through 21. <clears throat> and just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. <clears throat> Sorry. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God, and thus is the judgment of the world. And the people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who did evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. <clears throat> but those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen 
that their deeds have been done in God, and this is the word of God for all the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Oops. Apologize. I found this laying around somewhere. <laughs> I keep forgetting this important advice. <laughs> back out so it doesn't sound like I'm in a barrel. There are two methods that pastors use when they put a sermon together. The first one's called the spider method. And like a spider, it starts at a certain point and, and weaves the, the message together and, and makes intricate little entrances into the, into the page and Finally, when he's done or she's done, it has a full spider web. The second one is a, the, the, the uh, bee type method. The, you know, bees, they flit around different feathers. Feathers, they flit around. Yeah, I uh, was gonna say also, I think I already said, if I make a mistake, you're, you're allowed to laugh at me, okay? So <laughs> there, the bee will flitter around to the flowers. And it'll pick up pollen here, and it'll pick up pollen there, and, and it's all over there, and, and then it becomes in, uh, together, and, and that's called the B-type sermon. And that's the type that I use. Um, a lot of the information that I pick up is not my own, but the words are mine. I, I take and I form what I get, what I read, and I put it into a sermon, and, and by the time I'm done, hopefully it makes sense. Same way with the scriptures. The, the reason I like to, to read an Old Testament scripture and a New Testament scripture is because, not all the time, but a lot of times they, they intertwine. They refer back to one another. And these two scriptures fit well in that. Excellent job, by the way, of reading. Thank you. Sounds like you, you do study and, and you, you've done a lot of readings. And that brings up a question. How many here have read the Bible from cover to cover? Raise your hand if you have. Okay. Then how many of you have read all four Gospels? Now I'm talking from uh, um, Matthew chapter 1 on down to um, John chapter 25. Verse 21, or chapter 21, verse 25. How many done that? Oh, a couple. Good. Good. For those of you that didn't raise your hand at either question, how many of you have a Bible? Raise your hand. Okay, looks like everybody's got one. Now, I don't mean necessarily here with you, because I, I, sometimes it's people read and they follow, but sometimes they don't. But as long as you've got a Bible somewhere where you can, can reference then you're well on your way to finding out about how the Bible works, what it tells us, how it operates or we operate in this world. To be perfectly honest with you, I have not read the Bible cover to cover. To be perfectly honest with you, I have not read the Gospels from the first verse of the first to the very last verse of the last. But I have studied enough and read enough that I'm quite certain there's some things that these Gospels have in common. But a lot of the stories are in the same Gospel. A lot of the things they talk about is in the, in, in the, same, the same books. But they all have something just a little bit different. A great many of people who do read the Bible on a somewhat regular basis, usually, usually uses the lectionary, and that's the four verses that, if you got the news or if you got the email, I, I listed the four uh, scriptures in that. I I do usually preach from the lectionary, and if you do that and you read it on a regular basis, weekly anyway, uh, read it all four each week. In a three-year cycle, you will have read 
of the Bible. Or not word for word, but you will have touched on everything that the Bible is trying to tell you. And that's kind of the way I, I do. I, I, I read the lectionary and I follow it. I'm what's called a um, good news preacher, however. That means that the majority of my sermons come from the Gospels. I would say that 75% of the sermons that I've uh, put, written and given have come from the Gospels. I, I do uh, rely quite a bit on the Epistle, which is the New Testament, except for the four Gospels. On a couple of occasions, I've uh, spoken on the um, um, Psalms, but sadly, I have done very few sermons on the Old Testament. But I attribute that to the fact that I'm a good news preacher. I want to preach the good news found in the Gospels of Jesus Christ and his love for us and our Savior. That's why I concentrate normally on the Gospels. I can say for certain that each of the Gospels have a few different aspects on the person of Christ, on his life, and on his works. I can also say with certainty that each gospel is written to address different audiences under different circumstances, situations, and influences. For instance, the Gospel of Matthew, if you read that, you will discover that Matthew directs his gospel primarily to the Jews. That's the environment he grew up in. That's, that's who he he knew about that's that's the people that gathered around him and and so that's how he wrote his books so they could understand his books matthew primarily talked about uh, uh, jesus as the king and the messiah because the jewish people were expecting the messiah and matthew wanted them to know who jesus was the gospel of mark uh, presents his gospel with the Roman impact in mind because, you know, they lived in a time where the Romans ruled and, and so consequently he was quite familiar and influenced by the Roman people. And so when he wrote his book, he wrote to their ideas, to their thoughts that they might understand who Jesus Christ was. Mark wrote about the suffering servant of Jehovah and the accomplisher of mighty acts. So in a way, he too was thinking about the Messiah, but he was trying to prepare the Romans for the coming of Christ. When you read the Gospel of Luke, you'll find that Luke primarily writes with an emphasis to the Greek influence. There was a large community of, of Greek people in the area where he was, and, and he wrote with them in mind so that he could reach them and, and, and let them know about Jesus, the Christ. Luke's emphasis was Christ is the perfect man. Nobody's perfect, even though sometimes I think I am. Uh, my wife reminds me from time to time that I'm not. But there is those out there who, if they could just work and live and act and talk and be like Christ, they could be perfect. I've never met one of those yet, though. When you read the Gospel of John, you'll discover that John didn't have any primary race, group, or nationality in mind. John had the whole world, everybody, in mind. John liked to include believers, non-believers, sometimers, that's sometimes those that would listen to him and some that wouldn't, and then those that would never listen to him. But maybe, just maybe, they might pick up something and read that he'd written or heard somebody talk about something he'd written. He included the whole world. Can you imagine today if we were to be like John and we had the whole world in mind when we acted or spoke or thought how much better a place we live in would be? This morning, though, I want to concentrate on the, the Gospel of John and specifically on verse 16 in John 3.16. If 
I ask you to describe John 3.16, just that verse, in one word, what would it be? Did I hear something? Now, let me tell you about me a little bit. I'm going to ask the congregation questions sometimes. And it's okay. Feel free to answer back because I... Not only do you maybe hopefully learn from what I tell you, I can learn from what you tell me. So, does anybody know now, or can anybody answer with one word what this scripture is about? We've already talked about it twice. Love. Love. Very good. Very good. People in this church actually pay attention. <laughs> I joke, they, they did in all my churches. <laughs> Love, that's right. We're going to expound on that in here in just a little bit. We live in a society today that has gotten away from going to church. There are fewer people who have actually picked up a Bible, let alone read it. But I personally think that I could walk out on the street in any town in Kansas or in the United States and, and ask a person, can you give me one Bible verse, whether they are Bible believers or not? I personally believe that everybody could say John 3.16. They may not know what it means, but they know, they, they remember that because some of us, back in the 80s, I don't know if you're sports people, but back in the 80s, there was a guy at every major sporting event with, with curly orange hair, I think, and, and he used to have a sign. It's usually right when, in the goalpost when they were kicking a field goal. It said, John 3.16. So everybody's been exposed to it at some point or t in time. So everybody probably could say, well, yeah, John 3.16. I don't know what it's about, but uh, John 3.16. Thank you. Now, go read it and find out what it's John 3.16. Some of them might be able to say, well, let's see, John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Good! We're getting someplace. And maybe the rest of them could go a little further and, and speak more of it. But everybody should. Everybody can, but everybody doesn't. John 3.16 is about love. Love. The word love is mentioned in the Bible 686 times. In Psalms, 157 times alone. Now, I'm sure that depends on what translation you read, but like I say, I read the NIV, so my information comes from that. One of my favorite Bible verses that talks about love comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. And it reads, If I speak in the, tongue, in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not love, I gain nothing. Another verse that's familiar to some of us, a lot of us, that depicts the special love that God expects is found in John 5, verse 13. It says, Greater love hath no man or woman than this that they will lay down their life for their friends. Now, I'm sure that doesn't mean that God expects us to go out and die for them, but to lay down your life is to help somebody over the, tr the tough times, the troubled times, the times where they just think they're not going to be able to get through it. But when you go and help them and show them the love that Jesus Christ has for them, they're much better off than sitting there stewing, fretting, whatever else adjectives you want to put there. Now, I want to further define 
John 3, 16. I said love is the right word, but there's two words that actually covers this particular scripture or this passage. It's God's love. 316 is talking about God's love. There's all kinds of love. You can see love and infatuation, romantic love, companion love, conditional love, unconditional love, puppy love, maternal love, paternal love, soulmate love, spiritual divine love, love for your country or patriotism, self-love, tough love. Whew, that's a lot of love. <laughs> but the most important is God's love. God's love is what we all need and get from God. It's the highest form of love. We call it agape, which is a special word representing the divine love of God towards his son and human beings in general and believers. Now, the important word in there, in that phrase, is human beings in general because God loves everybody, whether they're believers or not. Some of us churchgoers don't think that, but he does. We're all children of God, and God loves all his children. Modern theologians have tried to captivate and understand this agape love, but they've failed. They've failed so many times because what they don't understand is that this is much more than an act of God. It's his nature. God is love. So God loves. God can love us and expect nothing in return. Now, it doesn't cost us anything. So why don't we acknowledge that and accept that? We, on the other hand, put a price on our love. Many times we find ourselves issuing ultimatums when it comes to love. Well, it starts when we're children, or, excuse me, young people. We say things like, if you like me, I like you. And then it evolves from there and gets worse. But God does not love us because we love him. God does not love us because he sent Jesus to die for our sins. God just loves us. That's his nature to love us. And the only security and the only safety that we have in this world today is God's love. God's love alone is enough to save us. God's love is a formula on how we should live. It's a, it's a formula on how to, how to deal with family. It's a formula on how to run our homes. It's a formula on how to run a community. It's a formula on jobs and it's even a formula for the church, if we use it right. I want to break this down just a little bit further. I, I love lists, as you can hear all the, all the things in here I've written down. There's four important aspects in this verse. The first one is so the supreme fact of love. The supreme fact is that God so loved the world. Oh, my English teacher would be patting me on the back because I'd broken down a sentence. The, the second supreme truth is the supreme truth of love. And the love, the proof is that he gave something. He gave his only son. And that's the third supreme gift of love. He gave his only begotten son, his only son, as a sacrifice for all of us. And then the fourth is the supreme goal of love, and that is, whosoever th ever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What a gift! A gift of love. God loves us even when we're loveless. When no one else wants to be around us, God loves us. When no one else wants to have anything to do with us, God loves us even when we do things to disappoint him. He still loves us. 
His love is not influenced by anything or anybody, and there's no hidden agendas to his love. In the words of John 3.16, we have the entire gospel in a nutshell. Love. God so loved the world. He taught us how to love. He wants us to love. All we need to do is love. God so loved the world that he sent his son is a manifestation of his love toward a sinning world. We are all sinners. We know that. We admit that. If there's a, if there's a sinner, if there's somebody in here that's not a sinner, raise your hand. <laughs> oh, good. I've never, I've never asked that question before. I didn't know what answer I was going to give. <laughs> if I was leading a Bible study and I said I like lists, I would ask uh, the people in that study to write down everything they find in that particular scripture. That one verse. There's a lot of uh, things in there. We find God, love, mankind, Christ, sin, death, atonement, life everlasting. And it's all held together with one mighty uttering. God so loved the world. There's no selfishness in God's love. It's a divine love. God loves us in spite of us. He loves us in spite of our condition, in spite of our hatefulness, in spite of our meanness, in spite of our underhanded activity. Now, don't sit out there and say, oh, I don't fall into any of those categories. We all fall into some of those categories. But God still loves us. God still loves us because that's who he is. We don't have to look a certain way. We don't have to dress a certain way. We don't have to live life a certain way. We don't have to drive a certain car. We don't have to go to a certain church. God loves us unconditionally. There's no, no limits, no requirements. Just be there and he loves you. God doesn't care if you're dark or light, rich or poor, skinny or ugly. Oh, excuse me, skinny or fat? <laughs> I'm thinking of myself. <laughs> he just loves us. If we could all show that same kind of love to every person on earth, what a wonderful world this would be. Let me conclude this morning with this story. There's a little boy who had no home, and he had no family. And a police officer observed him wandering around. He thought he was in, in, in having some problems, so he went up to talk to the little boy and carried on quite a little conversation, and it was getting dark out. So he said, well, you know, you really need to go home. And the boy said, I don't have a home. He said, my mother's dead. My father's dead. I don't have any place to go. And the policeman said, well, he said, let me, let me, let me tell you. He said, you go down this street here about a block, and he said, you'll find this big building, and there's a cross on it that says, Jesus saves. And he says, well, I want you to go down there and knock on the door, and when the man comes to the door, I want you to give him the password. You know what the password is? Little boy says, I don't know the password. The police officer said, the password is John 3.16. Oh, that's simple. So the little boy goes down the street. He finds the building with the big cross on it. says, Jesus saves. He knocks on the door. The man comes to the door and he says, what's the password? And the little boy says, John 3.16. The man says, come right on in. Sit by the fire and warm yourself. And so the little boy does. And as he's sitting there, he's thinking to himself, I have no idea what John 3.16 is. A little bit later, the guy comes back and he says, are you hungry? And the little boy says, yes, I'm starved. I haven't eaten in a week. And the guy says, come on into the kitchen. We'll fix you something to eat. And he does. And as the little boy is sitting there eating, he's thinking to himself, I have no idea what John 3.16 is. A little bit later, the man comes back and he says, are you tired? He says, oh, yes. He said, I've been on my feet all day for a week. 
And I says, come on, I've got a bed in here. He said, just lay down and rest yourself. And so the little boy went back, laid down the bed, and the minute his head hit the pillow, he says to himself, I have no idea what John 3.16 means. There are many people out there today who do not know what John 3.16 means. But you do. So when you go out this door today, you go out into this community and you show them God's love so that they will know what John 3.16 means. In other words, the challenge for you today is to pass it on. That brings me to special music. I hope my voice holds out. It kind of cracked this morning. Anytime you're ready. It only takes a spark to give some on a prayer uh, list that you've been uh, uh, lifting up and I'm sure I'll get a copy of it here before I leave but if there's somebody that uh, you know that is, has not been placed on that list would you like to lift them up at this time or if you have a joy that you want to share with the congregation of something that's that's happened in your life or your family or the town that you want to lift up uh, this is the time to do it Okay. Amen. That is a joy. Is the nursing home a lot of visitors now? No, only my appointment with family right now. Okay. But I, I got in. That's a baby step. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Yes. Well, after nine long months, Elsie's heifer finally had a calf Tuesday. Hey. <laughs> School, she's really excited to be there and watch it. Good. A lot of questions, and uh, her friends say even more questions. So. I'm sure they did. <laughs> she have all the answers. Are, are you a 4-H or dance? Well, good. It's, it's a good, it's a good uh, organization. 
Yes. I might mention that Carol and I are headed out for, on a vacation for about three weeks or maybe a little longer. And as my mama used to say, we appreciate people praying us there and praying us home. Okay, we'll lift you up for prayer and mercies. I, I also would like to ask you to keep Judy and I in your prayers as we travel um, to and from the, the services. Are there others? Yes. It's a treat to have the Fidens here. Uh, yes. <laughs> welcome back, is that what you're saying? Or welcome? They moved away. Oh, no! <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here. We are, too. We always will. Are there others? Yes. Got a birthday coming up this week. Oh, happy birthday. Thank you. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's what that's for. <laughs> uh, at the church where you used to come from, we'd have everybody come up front, and then we'd sing them happy birthday, but we can't sing, but happy birthday to you. Anything else? If not, let's be in an attitude of prayer. Too often, too easily, our eyes are drawn down, O oh Lord, to the suffering of victims and the pain of perpetrators or the wounds that we inflict on others and the wounds we inflict on ourselves. We need to see these things and pray about them, Lord. Pray for us, pray for them, pray for healing, pray for sickness. But we also need our eyes to be lifted to the signs of your life among us, to the touch of your healing on our souls, to the cross that cast its liberating shadow across all human affairs. We need our eyes to be lifted so our hearts may be filled with faith, hope, and love. Amen. Amen. I'm going to say the Lord's Prayer. I'd like you to join in if you can, and uh, if not, at least whisper it. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, done, on earth 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 as as it is in heaven. Give Give us this day our daily bread, and and forgive us our trespasses. trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. something in that and you wish to as you leave be sure and uh, and do that uh, before you put the candles out let me just uh, do a dedication of the offerings if we may would everybody uh, lower their heads and if you wish to raise your hands great and generous god our lives are surrounded by things that steal our lives inflict and destroy us the tithes and offerings we share with you this day are a way of keeping us focused not on the things that would take life away that will renew our lives, hope, love, compassion, empathy. As the Israelites looked to a serpent on a pole for healing, we look to a Savior on a cross to be brought back to life. In that holy name, Jesus the Messiah, we pray. Amen. May God's peace and grace be with each of you this week. I would ask you during the postlude to please remain seated. I don't know what your policy is, but... uh, some churches, when the postlude starts, people get, they think it's a marching tune and they get up and leave. I think it's, uh, it's, it's um, irreverent, if you will, to do that. Our pianists and, and music people spend a lot of time preparing to, to play for you in their service, and I think it honors them 
and gives them respect if we will sit and listen to the host before we get up and leave. Thank you. Thank you.